right now. I don't know if I can actually see you guys while I'm doing this. Uh, I need to share my screen. I feel like I'm at the start of class trying to get all the technology set up here. Okay. I think this is a position where we could get started here. So, uh, welcome um, everybody. So my name is Brian Koenig. I'm a psychology professor at Southern Utah University. Um, and, and some of you might know me as the IRB chair there. Uh, that's my, uh, another hat I wear. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, flipping my stats class in this open educational resource that I made um, called the Statistics Video Textbook. And um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide here, which is kind of my overview slide. So overall, my, my, my policy on questions is please ask them. Ask them as you have them. Keep them till the end. Email me later, whatever, uh, whenever it works for you, but it works for me. And then overall, my plan is going to show you the, how I introduced my flipped statistics class. I'm going to hopefully do a brief, like, kind of a demonstration, or I'm going to let you guys see what it's like to be in my class. Um, I'm going to explain why I did what I did, and then I'm going to explain like kind of how I run my class. Uh, time permitting, I'll talk about making open educational uh, videos, at least my approach, and then I have hopefully some time reserved for questions. Uh, but I actually, is, uh, I have a couple of documents I'm hoping to share by the end of the, uh, to share with you guys. So this is actually like a PDF how-to guide also. And so if anybody's interested, I can like, I can email it later or something like that too. I was hoping there'd be a way to provide it in advance, but I didn't see a way to do that. So anyways, um, I'm going to talk through what's my like icebreaker with my students and stuff like that, because we don't have too much time. But I, this is the first slide up in my class when my students are showing up. So I, I tell them it's the stats class, and eventually everybody sits down and I say, what's going on in this picture? And eventually somebody says that you can take a horse to water, but you can't like force them to drink, right? Um, and I kind of think of my class that way, and I try to get them to think of it that way, that I'm giving them all the resources they need to be able to succeed in this class, but they have to like do the effort on their side, right? Uh, my class has nothing to do with getting Giardia if you're worried about drinking out of the same water that cows are pooping in. That's a, that's just a byproduct of this picture I found online. All right, so uh, I tell my students that it's a flip class. What is it? They tell me what their thoughts are, and then I kind of explain what it is um, in my class or how I see it or how they'll experience it. Uh, so I tell them before they show up to class, they need to watch the videos, take good notes, and they have to submit those notes, which are worth points. And we'll talk about how many points they're worth later. Five points is uninformative without knowing the total number, which is a thousand. And then during class, they're going to work on problems, basically. Uh, but I'll do some demonstrations or whatever. Uh, and then after class, um, they could finish those problem sets if they haven't already, and then they need to submit them before um, or at the start of the next class. Um, and then I try I talk about why flipping a class is good, right? So I talk about the testing effect, which you like, um, you know, uh, if I do, I, uh, like, I talk about the testing effect or have them try to tell me what it is. But so it's basically this uh, finding that when you, you tested, you learn more than you do when you study for the test, right? And then they talk about the generation effect where when you produce the stuff, instead of just consuming it, you learn it better. Um, and so they'll get lots of opportunities for those things. And another reason I like to flip the class is it allows students to rewatch those lectures later on over and over again. Actually, this is something that turned out to be common now with COVID. We have to video record all of our lectures with Zoom. Um, and so it's kind of like that where they can rewatch them. Uh, but also these videos are, are free for my students so they don't have to pay for a textbook that they're going to read like, you know, the first one third of or whatever. Um, and then I kind of explain how to be successful in the class. So my statistics class is built on a cumulative approach to explaining the topic. Uh, those notes end up being super important. When they show up to class, they're not going to be able to do very well on the problem set if they don't have good notes from the video. Of course, you want to do all the assignments to learn all the material, come to all the classes so you can talk through the material with me and your classmates. I encourage them to practice for tests, of course. Um, and if they're having trouble, talk to me or the TA, who's currently Lizzie. And Haley was once in my class, so she is by far the best uh, tutor in the tutoring center for uh, students taking my class. Um, and then, because these videos are different than something they're often used to, I give them advice on how to watch those, uh, which is to watch them when they're uh, not sleepy, right, when they're bright and alert. They should do it in a quiet location so they're not distracted. Uh, a big monitor is valuable, um, and you'll see what they look like in a second, and you'll uh, probably agree. Uh, and then they should listen to that lecture, so they shouldn't have it on silent. But regardless, there's closed captioning that they can look at. And I double check that closed captioning, Google 
I'm sorry, YouTube automatically produces closed captioning, but it's not very good, especially for statistics, which has a lot of jargon. And so I went through with about a ton of time, me and student volunteers, and fixed all that closed captioning. And then I suggest they take great notes. Pencils are good because you have to erase stuff, at least I do, and so I think a lot of them would. And then, of course, they can review the video after class, too. So that's kind of my, my overall intro that I give them at the very start of the class, just to let them know kind of like, what they can expect in the class and that it's not going to be like them coming to class and just hearing a lecture and studying for an exam or anything like that. So next what I'm hoping to do is let you all kind of see what it's like. So um, what I'm going to do is have you guys watch about three minutes of one of my videos that my students would watch. It's just on making a frequency tables. Um, and then I'm hoping you'll take notes uh, on, on your notepad if you have one, right? Just like my students would. Um, and then I'll show you one question on that material and give you just a couple minutes to work on it. My students would be doing it in class with one another, but um, I don't know if we want to do breakout rooms. It's probably not worth your time in this context. So let's see, first I'm gonna get out of, there we go, okay. So I tried to pick a video where you can learn something that you can do uh, and I want to point out, so down here in the comments is the all the closed captioning for the video. So this is basically like the textbook text. If they want to look up some specific thing, they could come down here and double check it. All right, let's see if this works okay. Volume. Uh, all right, so it's going to play about three minutes. All right, so the next topic I want to talk about um, at a very broad level. So distributions are um, um, the how the data sets are distributed. And we'll, get more, we'll, we'll talk more about what that means uh, for a while. Okay, so let's uh, look at the sample uh, or here. Uh, so let's say uh, over Christmas break, So that's all I was going to show you guys. Sorry if you couldn't hear very well. I'm not sure how to do videos very well with Zoom. 
Um, so let's see here. So I hope, hopefully you are taking notes and then oh, problem set one. So let me grab my problem set, not question one for this day. So this is from my students earlier this semester. This is uh, January 20th and he, right here is what I was uh, have, gonna have you guys do. Um, work on for just a couple of minutes just tr to create a frequency table for these five data points. Gosh, I wonder if I could do one over here. I'm not even sure if I could figure out how to, to do one. Maybe just a little bit more time here. Uh, if you don't get it done, that's fine. Um, just to kind of give you a sense of what kind of activities my students would be doing. Um, and I made one right here. I don't know if I got it right. <laughs> uh, so I, I, one thing I find when I do math in front of uh, 25 students is math gets hard real fast. Um, so they'll correct what I uh, say often. But okay, so that's kind of hopefully uh, just a, a a, a taste of what it's like to be in the class, right? And so students just during class will work through a problem set. I'll come around, but uh, I'll talk more about the actual class time I spend with them in a little bit here. All right, so I kind of want to maybe explain the history of my motivation. Uh, and so I looked for textbook after textbook that fit the way I teach my statistics class. Um, and I use this approach where I call it the three distribution approach. There's always the population distribution on top, the kind of samples that you expect due to random sampling from that population, the sampling distribution. And at the bottom is the observed sample. And then during, uh, with regular statistics hypothesis testing, you're, you're hoping to find your observed sample is unlikely to have come from that population so that you can infer it came from a different one. Whew. So um, like all textbooks use this three distribution approach until they get to the first kind of test, basically the t-test. And after that, they stop using it, but I don't stop using it. And so I ended up having this problem where I would teach in class in a way that was different than the textbooks described it. Um, and so I just ended up like, that was a, a, one of the main reasons is I just could not find a textbook that taught statistics the way that I teach it. Uh, but also, I was hoping to find some good videos that covered the stuff the same way the same way I do to a large degree. And I couldn't. There's a bunch of great videos out there, but they don't like they're, they're, they don't really teach the stuff the way that I want my students to be learning it. So I ended up uh, that was another reason I wanted these videos that fit my teaching approach more. Um, I wanted the students to be able to digest the material at their own pace, like in class. Uh, I'm kind of a fast speaker, and so when I do my lectures, I'd go through it pretty fast, but this is statistics. And I think a lot of folks need time to digest it. So if they could pause during the lecture, I think that'd be fantastic. Um, and I wanted to be able to help more through the problems in class. So that flipped approach fit really well there. Uh, my guess is that many students stop reading all textbooks eventually, uh, not all students, but some. Um, and, and in particular, statistics textbooks, I think, are, are pretty unpleasant to read. And I think the, the videos maybe are less uh, unappealing than, than, the, um, than textbooks. And of course, just like I, with all like learning, I was hoping to have my students have lots of multimodal interaction with the material. So they watch it, they take notes, they do problems, they talk to their peers about it, they do the, the study, uh, they, they do the test review, then they take the test. They have lots of chances to interact with this material. Um, so that's kind of the old overview of, of why I did it all. Gosh, I think I might be doing all right with my time. Maybe you had that'd be great. Um, and then um, how I actually do the classes, uh, as I already showed you guys, I kind of explain how I flip the class. Um, but in practice, this is what ends up happening. So the students before class are supposed to watch however many videos are relevant for that topic. And they're supposed to take notes um, on that topic, good notes. 
and then they show up to class and I'll orient them to today's topic because you got to explain you know why is why is statistical power important or you know wh whatever it is uh, I usually talk for at least a couple of minutes and of course I you know remind them about like what the assignments are and those kinds of things but before long I just hand out that problem set uh, and the students start working on the material they'll have their notes out of course the ones who didn't watch the videos will get the videos out on their phones um, and they can work on the problem sets through the class if they get done early they can hand them in not too common um, they, if they aren't done they can bring them home and work on them until the next class um, and for me my experience doing this is nothing like a regular class so I show up to class I get all that technology set up it's, oh, it's such a challenge but I'm getting it right so then I just do whatever kind of you know small I introduce the topic or whatever five minutes at the start of class then I have to record everybody's spot because of COVID in case you know we get some, some outbreaks in the classroom and then I go around the class and any student who wants I, I can check their notes in class because those notes are worth points um, and also while I'm doing that they can ask me questions about the lecture that they had um, and then so I'll do that and then I'll go through and I'll hand back all their assignments so I'm running around the room again another opportunity for them to ask me questions and then for the whole rest of the class my time is open and I just go around talking with students basically um, and trying to see you know anybody having any trouble or whatever else come by um, you know Aiden how are you doing and I'll just talk to one student after another basically and then outside of class I have to score any assignments or whatever and deal with all the canvas stuff yeah with remote learners what I've found with them is I, I put them into a breakout room so that they're more likely to actually talk otherwise they're completely black screened and silent I put them into a breakout room together and then they're likely to talk to one another and sometimes they'll even turn their cameras on and then um sometimes not <laughs> I try to remember to go through and, and visit their breakout room uh, probably every like 10 minutes or so something like that but I also have the problem sets available on canvas uh, right at the start of class so um, they're able to do it at home too here so for the syllabus or I don't know how, how I structure the class so one thing that I do um, is so there's a thousand points right and so the notes are worth 15% of the class grade so I care I, I tell these students I care a lot about your notes because I want you to be watching those videos and taking good notes I care a lot about them I don't look at the details of their notes at all I just make sure that they took notes I just give them full points it's easy to get it as long as you do it yeah, yeah, like so. Yeah, the notes are really a superficial evaluation, and and during class they're totally talking with each other. I encourage them to. I think that they learn better if they're talking with somebody. Uh, once somebody like gets a big answer, like what the Z statistic is, I'm like, all right, everybody, what are you guys getting for the Z statistic? And then I'll write it on the board so people can like figure out if they're getting everything right up till that point. And if they're not, right, then they can go back. And if they can't figure it out, I can stop by. Um, and so those notes are worth just as much as these problem sets that they're actually doing in class. They're each worth five points. And altogether, that's 30% of their class grade. Exams, all, there's four exams and they're worth 45%, which is like a relatively low amount. Um, and the way I have my syllabus set up, there's a lab actually as well that's combined in for the four credits uh, for this class. And so one quarter of the points are for the lab. So in my class, just for the lecture part, if you will, not the lab, um, it's 30%. Um, the lecture knows the problem sets, 45% um, exams, and that's all the points you can get from class. So you really have to do these notes and the problem sets in order to do well in the class. You can't, this isn't a class where you can just take the exams and pass. You would fail miserably if you do that. Um, let's see, and then the, the, what my schedule looks like. So one thing that's nice is because I'm not lecturing, I, I never like fall behind in that sense, which is totally something that happens in the other class I'm teaching. I'm finding it takes me two classes to get through a, a chapter basically, which is not what I anticipated. So I'm falling behind there. Uh, and so this is kind of what my syllabus looks like. There's all the different weeks. There's the three days per week. There's the day of the week. And then there's the topic for the day. Um, and then the, these are the videos that they're supposed to watch. So for the very first day of class, there's four videos that they have to watch. And just, you know, these videos, like the worst day of the semester, they, I think they have like a 35 minute video. So a 35 minute video is the, whole, the lecture that they have with no reading. So there's no textbook reading, right? So that 35 minutes, that's less time than they would have lecture in class. 
So they have like, they, it really, I think, like opens up their time. So they can like, I've had a student just say to me, I rewatched that video three times. And I think that they actually aren't even spending more time when they do that because like the videos aren't that long. That was like, I think a 15 minute video that she watched three times is the Z-test video. So the videos are shorter than lecture and they take less time than reading a textbook. Uh, and they're probably more palatable because statistics is just not the most interesting thing to read about. I don't like to read about it myself, right? And, I'm, and I love statistics, so it's kind of a, a, a weird thing with it. Um, and so all my syllabus basically has though is these videos that they can click on uh, that brings them to the YouTube video. They're also in Canvas, of course, so they can get to them however they want. Um, I use Canvas like a ton, of course, for this, and I organize my modules by date. So uh, we just had the 19th of uh, February was statistical power. So there's a 22 minute video on statistical power, which is a really hard topic for students to understand, um, but they could totally rewatch parts of it or whatever. Five points for those notes, five points for the problem set. Um, I, you know, I put my PowerPoints on Canvas after class, because I like to be able to change them up until class. And then of course the Zoom recording that we have to do. Um, and one thing also I've found is that my PowerPoints used to be like, you know, 20 slides or something like that every day. And now they're like these two slides. This is this day's slides for the whole day, right? So I just went in and this is the, the um, you know, this is the, where we are as a class or so what's, what's coming up. And then I had this, a video where some expert talks about why statistical power is important and then, we switched over and students started working on their problem set for the rest of class. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how I, I made these videos. Um, and I'm, boy, I tell you what, I, I so I call it the, like a first edition of my textbook, it's a videos, but um, I sure wanna make a second edition now because uh, I've learned so much, right? That's the thing that happens when you do something, you just learn so much more about uh, how things work. Um, so actually, so if you're at an SUU person, you might have seen this. I already did this for like the CETL's um, semester, the start of the semester thing. But um, so briefly, these are the people that really helped me out. They all explained really important things to me. Uh, I first tried to do this by using the video conferencing classrooms where it records the PowerPoint and it records the lecture, which was seemed like it was going good. So A, this is a successful recording. There was tons of technology problems though. And so this, is, this often happened where, for example, I wasn't recorded. And so it ended up being like a false start. Uh, I learned a lot like from doing it, but it ended up not being very useful. So after that, I kind of like reorganized my thoughts. I got a course release, which ended up being super important. I read about flipped, um, flipped classes and stuff like that. Um, and then I have been taught, I taught this class over and over again, right? So I had everything prepared for how I wanted to do it for most topics, but every now and then I had to create uh, like, spe spe like specific content for a certain, uh, certain material. Oh boy, that would be fantastic if somebody else would have done captionings for me. Uh, boy, it took hours. Um, and, and so then to actually create the videos, um, I'd, I'd written lecture notes. Um, and I have like I, in the past, what I've done is all the textbooks I use, I'd taken all their content and put it together into my PowerPoints. But now I couldn't reuse that because I didn't want to, I figured it's all copyrighted. So I had to come up with new examples. Um, and then while I was recording, I also included all of my um, PowerPoint slides right there behind the glass board. So I could like, you know, maybe we pause the recording and I go through and make sure I covered everything I usually covered. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Yeah, it totally was. Um, but now it actually kind of saves me work. So it's kind of this weird, like a nice investment. And so SUU had this thing that we still do called Studio 97, which is a really, it's like a, a big closet with a camera, a glass board and stuff like that. It's not a great studio, but it's fine. Now we have this awesome one with a light board. So I don't know if you can, you know, so the, all of the, the color of that text, like I kind of, um, how do you say it? Like a, uh, you can't see it if, if I'm behind there because it's dark and I'm dark. But now we have a light board, so it glows. And so that problem is gonna to totally be gone when I finally get to redo these videos. Um, and one another thing I wanna do is probably make, make them five to 10 minutes max. That's another thing. I think students, I mean, it'll be such condensed material, but I think that they would be more like, it fits the way our modern students are in, you know, digesting information. And uh, for anybody who wants to do this stuff at SUU, these are the contact folks. I'm guessing that's not, 
not too relevant, but uh, so there's a glass board. Uh, they had a really nice camera. It took me a while to find good markers. The, the regular ones that you use on a whiteboard in front of a classroom are not opaque enough to be able to, to work with that glass board. In fact, my first three videos, it's a big problem. I didn't remake them, unfortunately. Um, but like I ended up, like I bought a ton of different kinds of markers and found some that are really thick. Um, and that brand was my favorite brand in the end. I got a light colored shirt so that you could make the more contrast, all the stuff I worked on. Um, so I got advice from Matt Nickerson because he was an early adapter of this technology of teaching like via camera. And uh, he, he's like, you gotta like talk to the audience and try to be like a person in there and be, be like with them, um, like mentally and socially. And so I tried to do all that kind of stuff. Uh, I haven't considered it. Um, I'd have to, I'm not even familiar with it, so I can check that out. Uh, one note, for, I'm going to copy that. I can follow up on it later. I'll be, yeah, because one thing that I, like the, the videos that you saw, I hand, um, I, I hand wrote the notes like you do in a lecture in front of a classroom, but in the future I was thinking for the next time I might do it instead where I would um, just like have all the stuff written and then it start recording and then I would just explain it instead. Yeah, the Google captioning, uh, the, sorry, YouTube, and Google owns YouTube, but YouTube's captioning, I thought was a pretty good way. Like it wasn't that hard to do it. It's just going through all the time. Yeah, I totally think it's important that they see me. I think that's a critical thing for student engagement. Um, I mean, like they, I could just have them watch Khan Academy in theory otherwise, but I can't, cannot stay engaged with Khan Academy. It's just boring seeing that stuff just handwritten. Uh, and so I think the social presence, the social connection is really important, uh, a really important part of it. I, I wouldn't mind doing like cute animations or something like that where it's not me, but there's this, these cute characters doing like stories um, and then like that's how the, the statistics is taught. I was hoping before COVID I was going to game, I was hoping to figure out how to gamify the, you know, this kind of a video stuff um, and like create more open educational resources, like, like provide all those problem sets and, you know, stuff like that for instructors and students. But um, I actually like had three students that are going to get paid over the summer to do all this and then COVID hit and then we didn't, I didn't get to do all that stuff. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure. What time does this end again at nine? How much time do we have? Nine thirty. So we're doing pretty good. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm not too. Sure. I don't have too much more to really talk about here. Um, so YouTube Studio um, is where. Uh, so I use YouTube for all the videos, um, and I found that most like what three quarters of views are on the computer, 15% uh, are on mobile phones. I think that's unfortunate because it's so small, you're not gonna be able to see all the handwritten stuff. Um, I tried to figure out how to create a standalone web page for this. Uh, I couldn't use our school servers. They just don't allow access like that. And so I ended up using Wix based on Lynn's advice, who's actually here in the audience right now. Thank you for that, Lynn. Uh, and it's free and it works fine. Um, you can't like upload HTML yourself that you write. You just got to figure out their you know, point and click interface and, and it worked okay, I think. And I ended up having a student kind of help me work through all that. Um, if you're interested, I mean, I'll totally share this document with whoever wants it, uh, but there's a lot, all the different steps. Um, and then who did what, I ended up, you know, like organizing all this stuff. And if I make it again, I'm going to make more videos, shorter ones, maybe 10 minutes max. Um, I, th I think that the students are like, don't want to sit for even a minute while like you're writing stuff. And so I want to like get rid of all that time and really just condense it. Uh, I don't know if it's good or not for the student learning, but I think it fits their preferences. And so I might even try it and like and see what happens. Um, yeah, and it'd be great to uh, actually we have like, an an like folks doing animations now, so. Uh, so students so far have really liked it. Uh, they really like the uh, be able to, to rewatch the um, to be able to rewatch those videos is something that they've said that they like a lot. Uh, but like if I ask them, I mean, they've liked that the 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 videos take way less time than reading textbooks. Um, <laughs> yeah, Lynn, I'm guessing they double time and triple time the videos anyways. And my guess is that's I didn't even know about those things until like until this project. And I'm guessing that's a very common solution that students have. Um, let me see if I had any, uh, I don't know if I had any other thing. 
Yeah, okay. Um, I can just keep this slide up as my question slide. No, I'd actually be happy to provide this PowerPoint uh, as well if anybody wants that. Um, so we, I think we have a, a studio, uh, like we have employees at SEU, I believe now, who, who make animations based on what I've seen coming out of like OTL. Um, does this affect your attendance to class? Can they access the problem sets without coming to class? They can attend them. Uh, I'm not sure if it reduces, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell because of COVID, um, right? Because I have students attending on, online that way and stuff. Um, gosh, I wish I had my, but attendance is, is pretty good, right? This semester, it's probably, it's better than last semester even, which I was using the same approach. Uh, I'd guess that um, like two thirds of students at the start of the semester, this is last semester, honestly, two thirds at the start, one third by the end. Uh, currently, um, we're still shooting at 20, I think there was 22 last time out of 25, is that right? Yeah, so I don't know, I think there's only four or five gone out of 20 um, on Wednesday, yesterday, so. Yeah, the, the, the attendance has been pretty good. And I find that for easy topics, fewer students show up to work on that problem set together. For harder topics, and the last two topics are confidence intervals and statistical power, the hardest topics in the whole class. So attendance was actually really good for those days. So I think students are kind of figuring out for themselves if it's easy or not. Uh, and that's affecting their attendance, I would say. But boy, I found that that's probably true of my statistics classes, even with the textbook and regular lectures too. Yeah, other thoughts or questions or advice? Got a couple of programs to look up here. I don't know if I missed any questions or anything. I don't know how to distribute these materials for anybody who'd want them. I don't know if the conference folks can uh, make them available on their webpage, the, the conference webpage, Mighty, Mighty Conferences. I think they're supposed to be, right? Although I don't see it. Yep, it's, it's recording right now, yep. Uh, for bu the buy-in, I'd say I've had, had no problem whatsoever. I think that they really like it. Uh, they like to be able to, to talk with one another during class, during the problem sets. They like to get to listen to Johnny Cash uh, all class. Um, they like to, I, I think they like everything about it. I haven't heard, heard a single complaint about it uh, since I've like done it. They, they seem to like everything about it more than they liked the, the other version where it's just you know, me up there lecturing. And of course, I mean, when, if students are struggling with something, if, I, if I'm, as I'm going around the classroom, if there's a, a common the, like problem, at, problem that people are having, then I say, everybody hold on a second. And then I'll go up to the front and then I can do like a, you know, a, a, a mass intervention and try to like help everybody understand that problem all at once. And then I can go back to the videos too and try to figure out, was there something in the videos that are, that are um, confusing students? And one thing that happened, so I don't know if you're perfect, but I'm certainly not perfect. And one thing I found is that uh, when I was lecturing, I'd often forget to do things like put the square symbol, uh, you know, for, for things. And then one thing nice about these videos is I did do that. I also did that then, but because of these videos, I was able to go back and, and fix them. Does this have one? Yeah, so right here, you can see these two lighter sum symbols. Those are fixes that I did later on. So I was able to go back and fix all of my videos whenever I've discovered a problem. So that's a nice thing. It's like going back and fixing your lectures. Um, so that was a really nice thing to be able to do uh, with these videos that I couldn't do uh, in person. Well, looks like it's 925. So hopefully there's a way to share these. Um, and uh, thanks for everybody. Um, good luck with all that you do. Keep, to, keep being awesome. Thank you, Brian, for that lovely presentation. Um, I'm going to drop a link for a feedback form in the chat if you'll all fill that out and you can move on to your next meetings. Thank you. Thanks, Addie. If anybody has questions, they could maybe still ask them, I think. I don't know if they're going to close this down automatically or not. I just did one in the chat. Um... <laughs> So I said, I'm in biology where we wouldn't do problem sets. We just memorize lots of fun information. Any suggestions for what the class experience would look like? Like what would the students do if they're not doing like, you know, problems together? What do, what do they do on the exams? 
So it's it's kind of like a lot of recall. It's not it's based on what you can remember instead of what you can perform. I'd have them remember stuff for the problem sets. I'd have, basically, I actually structure like my exams uh, and my problem sets are very closely related. And there's practicing stuff over and over and over again that's ultimately on the exams, which is basically working through these problems from start to end. They do that every problem set. And then that's what the exam is too. So whatever so the exam is like, have that be what the problem sets look like. Yeah, yeah, but just, yeah, just structure them the, the, the same way, basically. So. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah, Thank whatever you. you want them to do, just have them do it over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Now, we're doing a whole course. Yeah, so, um, gosh, for me, it, like, it was like multiple phases. It really took me probably three semesters to, I mean, so first I like tried to, like, for, I tried to do that recording in that one class. Um, and, and if you even so I did that and that didn't work. And then the next semester, what I did was I uh, recorded just a single video in the, the studio. And so I flipped one class for the whole like whole semester, just the, the hardest one, statistical power, probably the hardest one, uh, just because I wanted to see what students thought of it. And so I got a lot of feedback based on that. And I ended up, of course, redoing that for the final version. Um, and then I like did all that research and then I like invested some summertime basically into figuring out how to do this and I got that course release and that's the only thing that really I think enabled me to like totally flip the class. So it was like a bit of phases but uh, when I actually did the flipping itself what I did is my classes had previously had a bunch of problems on PowerPoints that I put in front of the students and then they'd be expected to work through them individually in class and then we would talk through them in class and so what I did is I just took all those questions copied them and pasted them into a word document and that was the first draft of all my problem sets so I kind of used all the stuff I already had and then I just like modified it a little bit to try to make it work mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions, suggestions? It's definitely a work in progress like that, pretty much everything. Not cool. Thanks, I'll head out. Uh, take care, everyone. <laughs>